It's been a really fantastic week, I think, for us. We uh, we started rolling, just to give everyone, um, you know, the, the deep dive insight. We, we started rolling um, just with, with podcast episodes. We've recorded about four um, and we weren't quite sure where we'd take us. And if you've listened to those previous shows, you'll, you'll recognize because, you know, Paulie and I have said it a couple of times that we just love talking. We just love hanging out. You know, the best thing about, um, our friendship is that it's also a friendship built upon how we can optimize our own lives, you know, cause we feel that we're both busy blokes. Paulie's a dad. I'm yet to be a dad, but, um, I certainly resonate with, uh, the word busyness, um, for better or for worse sometimes, I think. So this is, this podcast is very uh, meaningful for the both of us, and we hope that we can give you some value too. 100%. And just a, a quick reference point, if you're listening to this, you're most likely not going to have listened to an episode previous to, to this. There's True. This <laughs> opening episode. But yes. reference point, we have recorded four episodes uh, before this. So it may, as you continue to, t- uh, to kind of listen to these episodes, there may be like a, a, a different name for the show every <laughs> single episode. Uh, yeah, we, we, we're really pumped for it because I think we've all experienced uh, busyness uh, to a certain degree um, in our lives and whatever stresses that we have put on ourselves to, uh, you know, to bring bring that kind of challenge to the surface. Um, I think Tom and I really uh, make it our business and I'd love to kind of dive a little bit deeper into this, Tom, Mm. as to why we have kind of, uh, you know, kind of uh, extrapolated our own personal toolkits to be able to um, create a a filter in our own lives. Let's just take a bit of a dive, Tom, in in your own personal experience circumstances and what's led you to this path of well-being yeah yeah definitely i mean my uh my my path to to well-being was uh i think for most people started off um because i didn't really have a choice you know i uh i I was diagnosed with uh obsessive compulsive disorder in 2014 um it is something i still manage and i have um done all sorts of of work and tried to explore belief systems to move beyond, you know, I never wanted to be, I never wanted a a label to define who I was. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it's been a path for eight years now. And, um, it's, it's the the book I'm writing at the moment. It's book number four, um, taking on more of a clinical perspective, you know, because I work as a counselor. Um, but, uh, 2014 was a very challenging year for me. It started off with obsessive and intrusive thoughts toward the end of 2013. Um, they were always there, uh, but it was becoming harder and harder for me to, uh, disregard, I suppose. And, um, what came, uh, from that was a path of, um, deep reflection. And, you know, I, I, I learned different things, learned different mod- modalities. I was very interested in CrossFit. That's where you and I met, obviously. But I suppose one of the reasons why um, I'm really excited to niche down on helping fellas, um, you know, I think aside from clinical practice, you, you um, one of the great things about it is you're exposed to a variety of demographics, you know, and, and everyone has their, their struggles. And I think, you know, from the outset, th- this isn't exclusively just to listen if you're only a, a bloke, you know. The other reason that I'm really excited about niching in that area is because times are changing, I think, in a really lovely way. I think there's a lot of pushback and, you know, hey, you know, the world's done with masculinity. And I, I personally just don't see it like that. I think masculinity now is becoming something that it always should have been, which mm. is um, different for all of us. You know, and that's kind of what it is. That's the cool thing about it. You know, masculinity mm. used to be this idea that was only synonymous with uh, strength, power, domination. Um, mm. I'm the man. Let's, you know, leadership will go this way. And now it's becoming this thing that um, can be embraced by all different sorts of men and women, because at the end, masculinity is uh, is an energy, you know, and um, that's something that we hope to be talking about. But yeah, OCD, <laughs> funnily enough, was was my entry into uh, World Bank. Mm. Mm, love that. Thank you for the uh, the openness and uh, you know the, the the door opening to as to the journey. 
that brought you to where we are today because through these challenges that you've experienced and I'm sure continue to experience, it gives the rest of the world and those of us listening the gift of what you've been able to go to, go through and also guide the people that you are currently guiding and in the past and also in the future. Mm, yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And I think you, you can't, everyone, I mean, we all have a story and, and you know, I think the, you can alchemize pain into someone's sense of uh, direction, someone else, you know, every, everyone is at day one of some journey. And if you can speak to your own experience, there's something that you and I always love to talk about as well. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, that, that can be a force for good. And I think fundamentally human beings tell stories and you can use those stories to help others. So, but, uh, but yeah, tell us about your story then. That's a, that's a lovely little segue, Paulie. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, look, I, I've been in the health and well-being world uh, for about twenty years now. So, I'm not, uh, as mentioned before, I'm not a veteran. I'm a dinosaur. <laughs> exactly. And, uh, I've I've been around it for for quite some time, but I've also had a tremendous passion for the way the human body uh, and movement works. Um, that has evolved over time through mm. various challenges I've experienced myself. Uh, it evolved uh, probably about, you know, eight years into my uh, experience. It evolved into the, the the mind-body connection and how exactly we get results with our body through our mind and vice versa, up, down, top, up. And uh, I became fascinated with it so much. Uh, and I'll, I'll just edge into why and the impetus as to why I became fascinated by it. The the impetus really was uh, an uncontrollable neurological twitch that I've exper- experienced. Mm. I've experienced a series of these from young childhood. And uh, I continue to experience them. And I became fascinated by it. I first became very frustrated by it, um, embarrassed by it, uh, amongst many other things. And it kind of instigated a path as to where um, this this mind-body relationship begins and how it can kind of flourish as well as, you know, it started with me kind of saying, how do I interrupt this mind, yes. this, this, this subconscious uh, autonomic thing that is taking place Mm. but then it really continued my fascination into this mind-body relationship and you know i took it i took a um uh, a reasonable uh break from uh life in melbourne now when traveling uh to uh, india for about a year to 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 go straight to the source and kind of hung out in the foothills of the himalayas in Mm. damasala and just immersed myself in tibetan buddhism culture for for a long period of time really tried to immerse myself in the understandings behind, um, as I said, Buddhism, meditation, understanding what the the mind and body relationship is. And, um, yeah, I I just found that a completely transformative experience. Um, That was about 10-odd years ago, maybe a little bit more, and then I've come back, lived my life, continue to develop, uh, you know, my own practices when it comes to uh, the body, but as after I came back, I, my approach to training and health in general has been a lot more holistic than it has mm. been asked. So um, I, I continue to do that. Next major stage in my life, of, uh, apart from meeting my beautiful wife and, uh, you know, getting married and um, d- doing that was starting a family and the challenge mm. came up with starting a family. And that's when, you know, I really saw the need for for guidance when it came to my friends around me um, who were also having families and letting their health take a really big dip and backseat Mm -hmm. and understanding that their belief system was this is simply what needs to happen yes family ticking along the sacrifices that we need to make to keep our family moving forward and it it just didn't resonate with me i needed to find another way and that's not to say that there are times where you know you're not going to be able to go to the gym or whatever it might be but to be able to give to yourself so you can give to your family um, and those around you make so much more sense to me and Mm. that's been my mantra um as much as i can possibly make it and it hasn't been a a seamless 
transition and ride, but um, I've definitely experienced um, various different uh, challenges throughout that, th that but, but I've made it my purpose and my guide to uh, to guide men who are stepping into parenthood or who have dealt with parenthood for long periods of time mm. and continue to, to struggle in that realm. So uh, it, you're right, it's a new paradigm of masculinity and it's about owning masculinity and vulnerability at the same time and being able to immerse yourself in in who you are and what you want and who you stand for so you can be uh, physically and emotionally available to uh, your loved ones long into the future mm. oh mate wonderful yeah uh, beautiful beautiful words I, yeah love it absolutely love it um mate just as a as a short uh tangent um what can you take us through some of the um, um, practices that you adopted um, when you, on your travels in India and some of the things that you learnt spending time in solitude with, with spiritual uh, masters and teachers, I suppose? I just I, Yeah, I've, I've actually never really asked you about that and I'd just love to, to hear about it. Yeah, sure. So, um, I found my way in India. Um, so, like, I'd never been to a country like India. Um, and I think when anyone has stepped into India, they would probably always say that. <laughs> there is no country like India. It's literally yeah. like a, a country unto itself. Um Obviously, but <laughs> <laughs> so, <geographically> speaking. <laughs> energy wise, it's, yes, yes. Uh, th 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 there's an assault of the senses. There's um, your understanding of what personal space is in a yes. country growing up like Australia. Um, throw that completely out of the window. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, when it comes to India, but um, I digress. Stepping into, uh, you know, the foothills of the, like in, in Dharmasala, um, I, I attended a, I attended a um, Tibetan meditation, silent meditation retreat for mm. 10 days. And this was pretty much within the first 48 hours of arriving in India. I was like on a bus, which I'm pretty sure was put together with paddle pops and paper mache. And, like <laughs> uh, and it was like, and I was sitting there driving up this bus and uh, looking around and I was sat right next to this like really stoic um, looking Tibetan monk. And I was like, whilst there was a lot of chaos going on, I was like, think I'm going to like this place. And then this monk got out a plastic uh, a paper bag and just started chucking his guts up into it. Are you it. kidding? <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, like, over and over and over again, I'm like, okay. Nice. <laughs> India's going to be a hell of a ride. Yes. And, uh, anyway, found my way into uh, the uh, um, this gompa, which is – basically this med meditation hall mm. um from the moment we we arrived it was silence and uh yeah just the, the we learned so much about um you know tibetan culture and uh the buddhist uh, meditation traditions and how we can incorporate it into our everyday life we had something called mm. uh, our dharma jobs and this was something that we did every day which was something Maybe it was washing dishes. For me, it was sweeping the gompa with, uh, uh, as I said, the meditation hall, mm -hmm. um, which were with, with like a really old school kind of feather duster kind of thing um, oh. room. And it was about using an everyday um, menial task like sweeping the gompa or the steps, uh, but, but creating as much awareness and uh, mindfulness to it as humanly possible. And yep. You know, the setting and the surroundings that we were placed in was way up in the mountains, uh, monkeys everywhere. It was like, honestly, whenever I want to transform my mind and go back to a place where I am at ease, mm. you know how when, you, you, you know, sometimes, I, at least for me, you know, I, I can experience like, um, recordings where, uh, you know, the, the, the person on the recording says, go back to a place where yes. you feel at ease. And yes. that's the first place I go to. Yes. Right? Yes. 
and I'll find myself uh, in these uh, incredible scenarios. And and the cool thing is, is you know, you're you're in this complete silence, surrounded by not knowing who these people are around you either, because they don't talk either. Yeah. Um. So you start creating these stories in your mind. Who's that guy? Who's that girl? Like, yeah. what country are they from? Uh, what are their pasts oh, like? Yeah, because you wouldn't know. Yeah. You literally have no idea. Yeah. And I know after speaking to people after the event, people are like, dude, I thought you were like some Italian guy who, <laughs> yeah. you know, like no, no one no one knows anything about anyone. But the, the point is, is there's so much stuff going on mm. in our minds, uh, the chatter, uh, the monkey mind that continues to, um, the, the, which is part of the human condition, right? Mm. And, and you continue to create these narratives. But the cool thing is, is also once you eliminate that, that expectation of talking to somebody, uh, you, it opens up this whole new way of connecting. I specifically remember, um, you know, just sitting, uh, eating something and looking out over this stunning kind of landscape in, uh, in the mountains in India and some, a, a girl who I, I'm still Facebook friends with and uh, uh, she's just the sweetest girl. Um, she just recently had a child and it was, it was really nice. Um, she uh, came to me uh, obviously without talking, but she just went and she just was asking me to go for a walk together mm. and we'd probably been in each other's presence for about five, six days. And we just, went for a walk and without any expectation of making small talk without any ex because it was not an option yes you know? uh and once you remove those social constructs and potential anxieties like i know i fall, i i, I do fall into that category of, of some you know like filling in yeah. anxious gaps you know um but that wasn't an option so mm -hmm. to be able to just fully immerse yourself into just being and being with another human being and interacting with them whilst eliminating um the the the, the possibility of talking it's like mm. the comfort that you can just put yourself into with just kind of being was was really pretty special god it, mate uh isn't that, isn't that just awesome? And I think um, I've had a couple of friends that have done 10 day retreats, you know, and, and uh, you come up with so many personal realizations, you know, about, um, about how you interact with people, you know, and how many more decisions you have to make in life when you're an active agent in that participation, mm -hmm. you know, because you're, you're talking, so you're in there 50%. Yeah, and totally. it's, uh, it's something I've always wanted to do. Also, funnily enough, something I never realized you did as well. And um, that's really, that's awesome. I, uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to learning more about that, man, because it's, uh, yeah, as I said, it's something I'd love to do one day. Yeah, it, it, look, it was pretty special. It was pretty amazing. Uh, it wasn't, just to clarify, it wasn't Vipassana, which is what, uh, which there is a difference between what I did on that retreat, which has greater stimulus because we have, like, for lack of a better word, like, we had planned guided meditations and lectures, so to speak, where you would have, we had this hilarious dude who was our, um, our, our leader. So or whatever you want to call it, yep. who was a monk for, for decades. Um, and, uh, he would give us teachings throughout mm. the day on Buddhist principles okay. and our, in, from what I understand, which I haven't ever done Vipassana, Vipassana is very much a deeply insular personal experience where you are sat down for 24 hours a day, um, you know, concentrating on your breath in, in, in that uh, position. Uh, mm. I haven't experienced it, so I can't comment on it. But um, what this did was give me something a little bit more tangible to chew on principle-wise, Tibetan-wise, gave me texts to really dissect my own mind. And then what that did was it gave me theory. And then what it also did was it gave me practice element for me to take that theory and apply it. So yes. they would take a principle in um, what the Buddha taught uh, and then uh, let's take the principle of empathetic joy um, to be able to 
have unattached incredible joy for some somebody outside of you without mm. any uh jealousy or a- anything of that 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 sense mm. and to be able to take then an hour to meditate on a single concept uh to be able to use a um a path or a, a module for you to be able to train your mind to become to have that what they call um what do they call it <laughs> a shamata which is single-minded focus mm. be able to train and strengthen the um the the follicles or the the the, the capacity of your brain mm. be able to to have that single-minded focus so you can then apply it to the sport of um you know empathetic joy or whatever principle it might be and i and i look at that and i say you know there there are easily uh, some comparable principles between mm-hmm. training the mind and training the body you know yes. practicing shamatha is like strengthening your core or your uh you, you, your your single leg leap, and yeah. then and then and then applying that shamatha to empathetic joy might be to go out for a mark in football, you know, yes. to, to to transition that into the application of sport, the sport of empathetic joy, or whatever it might be, the practice. For sure, um, and look, I'm just going to be really selfish here again because I'm just really interested. What was there something you were missing in your life prior to going on that kind of? spiritual journey i suppose if you'd call it that or what was there something you were trying to seek as mentioned before the 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 impetus for me doing that was the struggles that i'd experienced with my uh with my tics okay yeah I, i i really struggled with it um it was a manifestation of anxiety that would come out through my body and and it's happened i've had i've struggled with tics my entire life when i was really young i would have really overt tics and um you know i've gone down the path of various different medicines to be able to look at that Mm. i mean sometimes i i had at some stage um being brought to a, a neurologist and um they were like you've got to go on you know whatever neurological medication yeah. to be able to uh, control these ticks and something within me was like this this needs to i need to find another way yeah and and and, and whilst that was a physical manifestation i think i i appreciate that that was my body's way of dealing with anxiety and um at that particular point in my life i just feel like um i needed more i needed to learn more and i needed to find out more about not just my own personal situation but also what our minds and our bodies and putting them together are actually capable of yes and now we live in this world where we can go on the uh, various different websites and and see you know this icebergs of studies that are like quantifying everything that you know we may be thinking about um and uh you you can look up a study and go wow you know a phd has actually taken the time to devote two three four years of their life to be able to qualify this in a statistically backed up data rich manner Um, whereas 12 years ago i was just kind of going on a little bit of a a whim and a hunch um and and just to 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 kind of explore that path within me Mm. but but that doesn't that also doesn't negate the fact that we we also, as human beings, need to find what intuitively resonates with us. You know, and you know, at the time for you, a uh, you know a neurologist saying A, B, and C might have been enough for you, but but it also wasn't. You know, and it might be for someone else, but it wasn't for you. And I think what's really wonderful, what I'm really excited about this podcast, just as love a little um, show of coincidence, I believe, is that. Not that I'm necessarily giant on labeling disorders and so forth, but I believe tick disorder is actually in the category of obsessive and related disorders, which is mm. what brought me into this path. And, and I went down that route as well. Um, I wasn't, it wasn't as immersive, but, um, you know, even just going to India, you know, as an example, one of my, 
one of the books uh, that transformed my life immensely was the Bhagavad Gita. Mm. We're talking about Dharma, you know, the fruit of the labor is to be found within the labor itself. And all of these ideas that have just been wonderfully transformative. I just think that's lovely that, you know, ticks, obsessions, whatever it is, you know, what I came to learn as well is exactly the same as what you learned is that OCD for me was and is a manifestation of how I deal with uncertainty, you know, mm. and it can be wonderfully uh, powerful and a superpower to become gross and obsessed in, with things, but there are negative external externalities associated with that in the running of intrusive thoughts and obsessive thoughts. So I think if you can just, whatever it is, ticks, forbidden thoughts, you know, we all have to walk on these lines and ensure that we view our minds and our bodies as these things to be cultivated and harnessed for their potential, mm. whilst also being aware of the negative side effects that we can do work in to balance and restore and maintain. Yeah, beautifully said. And uh, it just shows how powerful our minds are and what we are able to uh, do to be able to strengthen these muscles uh, either internally or um, externally to be able to um I suppose, uh, channel uh, an actual solution or um, a direction that we, we are trying to take. And that, that speaks to kind of the, the bottom down, sorry, the bottom up and the top down kind yeah. of approaches that we will continue to explore throughout this show. Um, I love both. Um, you know, you've deeply immersed yourself of recent times in this top-down um, uh, experience and methodology, which I love because I, I think I, whilst have I have definitely, um, you know, in an informal sense kind of explored that side of things, I've really decided to immerse myself in the bottom up, mm. um, which is to give a brief explanation of that top down really is being able to use your um, faculties mentally um, to be able to have an influence on your body mm -hmm. um, and, and might. Yes. And <clears throat> bottom, bottom up is to be able to use tools externally to be able to have an influence on your, your mind. Yep. And body. So, an example of this. Did you want to maybe use an, uh, go through an example of something that might be uh, top down? Yeah, for sure. Well, I mean, and, and I think it's you. You make a great point, and I think we we both believe that you need to use both. You know, I think for me, what 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 has helped as an individual, and I think that's why I became interested in the top down approach, is um, understanding the way the mind works such that we can become more aware cognitively of how that influences our behavior. Mm. Um, there's a lot of this. I mean, a lot of that is, is kind of CBT related, which is kind of, you know, what we view as the gold standard of therapy, but not everyone is uh, a computer. <laughs> and you want to just go through what CBT is and you don't need to, you know, uh, open up the encyclopedia. Yes. But <laughs> it's a very broad term, but you know, simply put, it's just, it's called cognitive behavioral therapy. And it's just becoming more aware of how our thoughts affect our feelings, which affect our behavior. Mm -hmm. And top down is, you know, when you might speak to a therapist and you might say, oh, well, this is happening. And then we kind of put together a map of what's going on because so much of the human being is a doing thing, but we don't necessarily explicitly understand what it is that we're doing. And that's when you have an honest conversation with someone, you go, oh, that's what I'm doing. Cause I thought I was doing this. So mm -hmm. we can become more aligned in the way we view ourselves and how that extrapolates into our behavior. Mm -hmm. But the thing that I like about becoming more aware of that is that it then overlaps into the bottom up approach of doing things externally that then have a positive feedback loop of, onto your behavior. That's what I say to clients all the time. It's when you're aware that this train of thought, because look, for the most part, we can't really change our thoughts and our feelings. Mm. You know, I can say, hey, let's think of a pink elephant. And there you go. You can think of a pink elephant. <laughs> um, but for the most part, thoughts and feelings, at least as far as I understand it are these kind of subconscious processes you know we're taking in information all the time and things yeah. are just coming into the bowl of our mind <laughs> what we can change is our behavior you know we do i mean behavior it's very much habituated 
And it's something that we also need to be cognizant of, but we can change our behavior. And that, you know, if you look at the triad, thoughts, feelings, and behavior, that does affect thoughts and feelings. So to your point, using an example, let's call it um, a cold shower or a cold plunge, Mm -hmm. you know, we know that exposure to cold, um, you know, we can talk about hormesis and all that kind of stuff in in later shows, um, has an effect on the dopamine system, which Mm -hmm. makes us feel good, you know, Mm -hmm. and that therefore, you know, if if we decide behaviorally to, to have a cold shower, we recognize that therefore we will feel good after it and feeling good is going to have an impact on the way we think. Mm -hmm. So it's a top down and a bottom up approach. And I think you and I have just kind of, hopefully on the podcast, we're kind of meeting in the middle, um, taking what we've learnt um, um, together. Spot on. And uh, I think the, the awareness of both is, is key, you know, time and a place for, for all, but also there's a time and and a place for all dependent on how the individual learns, yes how the individual is receptive so there's no one size fits all you know it's about um understanding how somebody will will learn this perhaps um cr- creating awareness to somebody's um anxieties and insecurities uh, may be the first step but then perhaps when you are in that anxiety when you are in that that struggle yes. To be able to use a bottom-up tool like like breath work, mm. be able to calm and bring you out of that uh, sympathetic nervous system into the parasympathetic nervous system, using that tool to be able to then kind of take the edge off, so you can open up that door yes. to uh, to creating a little bit more mental awareness about what you're going through. So all of a sudden, now you're dancing with both tools. You know, you're going top down and bottom up at the same time, mm. but being able to have that balance of just enough of edge so you can actually just deal with the shit that you're going through right now. <laughs> yes, yes, you know? exactly, exactly. Well, mate, you, 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 you're totally right. And I think, um, you know, I, I, I hope this kind of gives, you know, listeners and our audience uh, a bit of an idea as to who we are and, and, or, and also start to recognise that, we have a lot to talk about, you know, and we're really <laughs> excited to, to talk about it, you know, and I think, um, you know, there's a point that I've really stressed and I've wanted to stress on on episodes that we have already recorded, which you'll, you'll listen to, hopefully, if you like the show so far, is that, um, you know, Paulie and I are, are so aligned um, with how we think and how we view the world and even our own fucking experiences, you know. Um, it's very, it's just very fulfilling for us to be kind of, you know, um, starting this podcast again. I think it's been a long time coming. Um, mm. and, um, yeah. And, and we really hope that it brings you guys, uh, some, some value. Yeah. Beautiful, beautifully said. And I think to that note, we've also made a commitment to each other to keep these episodes as consumable and digestible as possible. Yes. So I think we're up on that, um, that moment as well, because if we don't, Geez, we'll just be in your ear for <laughs> forever. So, we'll, keep, we'll just keep going. <laughs> we'll just keep going. We'll just keep going. And we both like coffee, so it is dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> Which we can definitely talk about in future episodes, the benefits and the potential uh, dangers of coffee as well. So. Yes. Uh, looking forward to that amongst many other things. Thank you uh, for having us in your ear for the last 35 or so or so minutes. We've enjoyed it immensely. And I mean, we just love doing this. And uh, if you haven't been able to tell already, this is like a true passion project of both of us. Um, I think Tom and I love engaging with each other and feeding off of each other. If you have any questions or directions that you would like us to take, Mm. we are very much open to being able to hear that and take um, various episodes and be guided by you, the listener, because ultimately we can sit in here and, you know, have a have a joyous old time for the two of us. But ultimately we are trying to do this to be able to give you guys something to to think about and to act upon more Mm. importantly. Mm, totally man totally we'll uh we'll uh we'll be catching up twice a week we'll make sure we uh stick to to two shows a week and um we look forward to to hearing from you guys thanks so much for listening thanks guys bye